Good morning, Praxis. It is so good to see you again. For some of you, you might go, again, who are you? Uh, my name is Cliff. I'm uh, one of the pastors at Westside Church, but I'm also one of the uh, task force members here at Praxis. I'm part of the leadership team, and so I've actually been here quite a few times. I think it's like my fourth time. So uh, if I feel really at home, now, now you know why. Uh, how are you all doing? Okay, just checking to see if you're with me. Sometimes 9 a.m., it might be a little early. Uh, we have a fantastic text today, Genesis chapter 44 and 45. But because there's a lot in this text, uh, like, like literally so many verses, we're not going to read the whole thing, which is our normal practice here um, at the church. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, the two chapters, and I'm just going to highlight certain verses and read them with us. Uh, but I really encourage you to go home if you, if you haven't yet, and to just do a deep dive, a slow dive, and read through those uh, two chapters. Listen, I don't know if you're the only people that are exempt from this, but in my opinion, in my observation, uh, things are getting really difficult right now. They, they've been getting difficult for a long time. Like a few years ago, we're dealing with a, a global pandemic, and there's never been a, a global phenomenon since the flood. And so th this is a really big deal for us. And then we're like, whoo, we got, we got through that. But there's always something for us to navigate. Whether it's pandemics, uh, whether it's politics, whether it's fires, uh, whether it's wars, take your pick. There is always something for us to have to navigate. There seems to be no reprieve. And if that's not enough, on top of that, this ongoing pressure, this ongoing angst that's working its way through society, uh, we're actually not doing a great job navigating that which is presenting a whole new set of problems on top of the existing issues. Like mental health is a, an issue right now in our society. People are struggling with depression and anxiety, and they're working, they're working hard to work through it. Uh, we self-medicate as a culture more than ever just, just to try to just have a reprieve. But it begs the question then for Jesus' people, how do we react? Like we live in the same world. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. What does that even mean? What I love about God in his grace is that he gives us assurances. Like when things seem like a big dumpster fire, kind of like it is right now, we have assurances. And, and whenever, when you were in Sunday school and you were asked a question and you didn't know the answer, what was the answer 100% of the time? Yeah, Jesus. But that's actually true. Like for you and I, God in his grace gave us assurances to navigate difficult times. And one of them is, is Jesus himself. Specifically in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, it's a fantastic verse. It says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Verse 16, so let us hold fast with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why Jesus is an assurance is because whatever you and I are going through in this moment, we have a God whom we serve, Jesus, who has experienced everything that you've experienced. Not the specific example, but the general. Like Jesus had anxieties. He was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Like he, He's sitting there, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. There is anxiety. There is angst. There is betrayal. Jesus had it all kinds of things that he had to struggle with. Unsureness of, of where to sleep the next day. Like there was challenges and we serve a God who knows exactly what that's like. One of the first things I'm gonna ask you to do is to consider how, for those of you that know Jesus, how you are engaging with Jesus. Because if, we, we serve a God who knows exactly what we're going through. He's imminent. He's right here with us. He's not so transcendent that he's unaware. What I love about Jesus being an assurance for us, if you look in verse 16, by the way, this isn't even my text. Uh, this is just bonus, that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because of Jesus, 
and that we know we've had this salvific encounter with Jesus, we can go to God the Father and receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There are two practical, tangible gifts, enablements that we are given when we have a time of need. Have you ever gone through something really hard and you look back and go, I don't even know how I did that. I don't know how I got through that. I, I don't want to go through that again. What, what, what happened? Well, Verse 16 happened. Jesus, your great high priest, because of who he is to you, Lord, God, Savior, and King, was supernaturally giving two things to help you in a hard time, grace and mercy. We have these assurances. God gives us assurances in hard times to be able to navigate this, uh, uh, these hardships, these challenges. But there's another thing that uh, God has given us. Uh, in Scripture, we obviously get to know God. We get to know what he does. God gives us um, insight into how he works and how he thinks. Theologians will call this the doctrine of providence. This is for your comfort. This is for your well-being. And I just want to unpack that because through our, throughout chapter 44 and 45, we are going to see the doctrine of providence. So if we say God is sovereign, that is that God has a plan and he does whatever he wants to do. That's, that's God's plan. God's providence is God intimately involved in the day-to-day -day details to ensure that his plan is fulfilled. Okay, do, you, do you see the difference? Sovereign, God has a plan. He can do whatever he wants. God's providence is he's in the minutia of the day-to-day -to, -day to ensure that his plan, his will is accomplished. That is to say nothing is going to stop God's plan from being accomplished. Nothing. So what I love about today's text is the degree to which we can understand and trust God's providence is the degree to which we can navigate uncertain times with certainty, and number two, recover from hardships like loss, pain, disappointment, and betrayal. In today's text, this is exactly what we're going to see happen with Joseph. Because he was able to trust, understand and trust God's providence, God's involvement in the day-to-day -day minutia. There's nothing random, but everything is happening for a specific pur purpose. Joseph was able to navigate uncertainty with certainty. And number two, he was able to recover from hardships like loss, pain, disappointment, betrayal. As Jesus' people... What I, the doctrine of providence gives you and I assurance. And that should be healing for us. Like my wife and I, we've, we've had to actually navigate a lot of hardship, um, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. And, and my wife Erin will say, the doctrine of providence is one of the things that has allowed me to forgive people who have harmed me. And so I love this text because it is so pastoral. It allows you and I to navigate difficulty and to recover from hardship in a fantastic way. So with that, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 44. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you that we have an assurance that you're gathered here with us. Where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst and so, King Jesus, I just pray that as we just come together in your name, that you would just meet us wherever we are at. That if we're in a vulnerable time or a, a hard moment or a confused moment or a painful moment, that you would just come and meet us where we're at and give us whatever it is that we need. You know us better than we know ourselves. So by your Holy Spirit, just come and, and give us what we need through this text. We pray this in your good, good name. Amen. Okay, Genesis chapter 44. Let me read uh, verses 1 through to 4. Genesis chapter 44. This is, you, you, if you're not, um, I've been a part of our series here. Uh, I'm going to give a lot of recap, and I'm going to give you just a full-on fire hose of information. So um, write it down or go back online if it interests you, and you can, get the, you can get the information. But here we go. Let's read starting verse 1. Then he, Joseph, commanded the steward of his house Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. 
and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for grain. And he did just as Joseph told him. Verse 3. And as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. And they had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up! Follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? So let's just stop there. What's Joseph doing? Like, it, it, it's, he's, he's literally, it's like he's framing his brothers. Why would he do that? Is he wanting to take revenge? Is he wanting to have some kind of mind games? What, what is Joseph doing? And I want to say that I, I believe Joseph is pretty skittish in this moment. Not skittish in that he's, in, uh, he's worried about his safety. He's the governor of Egypt. He could squash them like a bug. That's not what he's skittish about. To understand what he's skittish about, let's, let's do a quick review. In Genesis chapter 37, a 17-year-old Joseph, about 20 years behind our text, 20, uh, 20 year old Joseph had, or 17-year-old Joseph had a dream, actually had two dreams that he presented to his brothers, and they did not go well. One dream was to the effect of um, uh, your uh, sheaves are going to bow down to my sheaves. Another one was uh, the stars and the moon and the sun are going to bow down, bow down to me. And these were direct reference to the brothers bowing down to Joseph. The brothers didn't really like that. And it started a series of unfortunate events uh, for Joseph for the next, it's hard to know exactly, 18 years, 20 years. The brothers were so upset that they planned to kill Joseph. And they settled on just staging his death, but banishing him to a foreign country forever. So, of course, Joseph is going to be a little skittish. Why? Because as he's looking at his brothers, he's like, is this dream about to happen? Or are they just going to do more shenanigans? And Joseph is trying to discern what God is doing. Joseph is taking time in chapter 44 to discern God's providence. Here's what we know. Joseph isn't questioning if 17 year old, his 17-year-old self, if those two dreams were of God. He's got that locked. I don't know if you remember, he's already had four supernatural encounters as far as God speaking to him through dreams. Twice when he was in prison, he had... Uh, dreams uh, of the two inmates to come up, and Joseph correctly explained what those dreams were. A little while later, while still in prison, Joseph was supernaturally given the dream that Pharaoh had and then correctly interpreted the dream. So Joseph isn't concerned about if his, the dreams that he had when he was 17 years old are going to come true. It's just when. How? Is this now? And can you just, just take a moment and to just consider, put yourself in Joseph's place in that moment, the risk that he's working through right now. Going, what, what, is this this moment where this dream comes? How, how do you navigate? This is a risky, vulnerable moment between him and God. And Joseph is going to have to discern in this moment if he's going to take a risk. And brothers and sisters, as you and I navigate through uh, the rhythms of our lives, we have to have confidence. We have to have some assurance that what we are doing is in step with the Lord. And what I love is that God gives us assurances. He gave us the scriptures. If, if we ever want to know what God has for us, a Genesis to Revelation, the entire library of scripture is going to give us everything that we need, as Peter says, for life and godliness. And so we can have this confidence that we are in step 
but we need the discernment process. We need to take time. Like Joseph wasn't triggered. Like if, if it was today's uh, moment, he'd go, I'm being triggered by my abusers because that's what his brothers were. No, he was stopping, prayerfully considering and discerning what the Lord is doing. The simple takeaway is that when you and I are navigating uncertain times, we have to stop, not react, just stop and consider, Lord, what are you doing? What are you saying? Another assurance that God gives us is his Holy Spirit. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For Jesus' people, there are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some of these gifts are discernment and wisdom and faith that you and I can have some confidence, not of ourselves, but from God himself, that we have the ability to navigate, to understand what it is that God is saying, what it is that God is doing, and what it is that we are being called to do. And this is such a tense moment for Joseph, because what is, what, what's he supposed to do? And after a time of discernment, chapter 45, starting in verse 4, So Joseph said to his brothers, come to me, please. Remember, they just know him as the governor of Egypt. They have no clue that it's their brother that they staged his death. And they came near and he said, I'm your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Man. This was the victim speaking. The person who was hard done by. He was cheated and lied and forgotten by everybody. His family, Potiphar turned his back on him. He was forgotten in prison. It could have felt like he was forgotten by God. What happened for Joseph to get to this point where he could say in verse five, don't be angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you. God sent me here before you to preserve life. How do you get there? How do you overcome the hurts and the pains and the hardship? How, how, do you, how do you not get angry at God for feeling forgotten, for all the wasted time, for, for everything that's been missed? What happened with Joseph that allowed him to get to this place where his relationship with God was intact, that he actually saw God was doing this and that he saw something good in, in and about this. This is unbelievable. I want to take the rest of our time to actually try to understand providence. Like what, what, what happened? What are some things that would be helpful for us to know? And so let's take some time to understand providence. The first thing that in understanding providence is that we have to recognize that there are two realms. There's the spiritual and there's the physical. And you and I, in our first world context, we forget that. We forget that we're instructed to walk by faith and not by sight, to walk by the spiritual, not the physical. You and I have to sit there and be okay with the idea that we are not to get too focused on the physical. There's a fantastic uh, story in Scripture in 2 Kings chapter 6. And what you see is uh, you see uh, Elisha and you see just this young assistant. He's, he's not even named. And there was a difficult situation. They were surrounded. They were in danger. And in the physical, that's all that you could see, the hopelessness, the, the sure failure, 
The idea that they're going to be overcome by the enemy. In the physical, that's exactly what is happening. But Elisha does something fantastic. He prays this prayer that his assistant would be able to have his eyes opened. And if you go into that text, time doesn't let us, you see that his eyes are opened and there are chariots of fire all along the mountain ridge. They're not surrounded by their enemy. They're they're surrounded by God himself. Throughout scripture, God uses fire as an example that his manifested presence is with them, right? Remember that with Egypt, uh, when, when the nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt, God said, I'm with you, a pillar of fire. Moses, the, the burning bush. And here in 2 Kings chapter 6, we saw the colliding of the two worlds, the physical and the spiritual. But do you notice that the two realms are juxtaposed from each other. This is, you and I have to be okay with this. Just because in the physical, it looks really bad. It looks like the odds are stacked against us. It looks like it's a hopeless situation. That is not to say what's happening in the spiritual. That, that's not it at all. We have to be okay to, to, to see these two juxtaposing realms and go, Everything's a mess. There's there's uncertainty in the physical. It doesn't mean that everything is uncertain in the spiritual. And you and I, as Jesus' people, are being trained throughout Scripture to train our eyes on the spiritual. Walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Let's let the things of faith inform us, not not the physical, not the things that you and I see. So you and I have to to understand providence, to sit there and go, God is involved in the everyday little details. Even when things are seeming like they're really bad, it doesn't mean they're really bad. God is going to work in these hard situations. The next thing that we see is that God is involved in everything. If you got your Bibles open to chapter 45, we'll just look in verses 1 through to 9. You see five times in these nine verses God's involvement. And so just so we're clear, whenever you see a repetition in Scripture, that's God saying, hey, pay attention. This is something that you need to hear because it's going to be easy for you to forget. So there is something very specific here that it's God's fingerprint involved in all of this. Verse 5, it was God, this is Joseph talking, who sent me here before you to preserve life. Verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve life for you, a remnant on the earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. Verse 8, not you who sent me here, but God. Verse 8 again, he, has made, he, God the Father, has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his house, Pharaoh's house, and a ruler over the land of Egypt. Verse 9, it was God who made me Lord over all of Egypt. It's interesting because what we see throughout this section of text Joseph is fully able to reconcile the hard things that he's gone through, that it was God who was in it. He didn't have a crisis of faith. He he didn't sit there and blame God. He didn't react and grow rebellious towards the things of the Lord. Well, if that's loving God, forget that. This This was the abuser or sorry, the abuse victim who went through this and who's saying this. It was the victim who was saying this. And Joseph, I love this, never saw himself as victimized. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Why? Because Joseph is able to reconcile that God is involved in everything. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. In him, in Jesus, all things hold together. And in the Greek, all things means all things. 
So just stop. The, the fact that you're here today, it's not chance. It was a providential God who caused you and I to be in the same room today. I don't know exactly why, but that was God. There's nothing random. Your quality of health, that, that was Jesus. The fact that we're breathing, our hearts are beating. It's Jesus who's holding everything together. We need to remember that when these things happen, we're not forgotten, we're not abandoned, we're not forsaken. God is involved. And it begs the question, why would God allow this? Why, why would God be doing this? And the next thing that we see in understanding providence is that God moves everything in a redemptive direction. God moves everything towards redemption. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, uh, God the Father is making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So what's his purpose? What Paul is saying is it's to unite all things in him, to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. That is to say that absolutely everything in the created order is on this track that's being moved to be reconciled with Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. This is why God is working everything. It's why when Paul in, uh, is in prison, he's in a bad spot. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 Paul says, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Even there, Paul is recognizing that the difficult situation that he's in, in prison, for doing nothing wrong, it's serving to advance the gospel. Here is a truth that might be hard for you to take. When we read scriptures that all things work to the good, to them that love God, called according to his purpose, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, God's definition of good is different than yours and mine. You and I will define good as cushy, blessed, best life now type stuff. That's not what God does not define that as good. Good is a redemptive track where there's united in Jesus, in things in heaven and things on earth. That is good. And so in the economy of scripture here, it is very, very simple for God to allow the apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 to go through something hard for a redemptive purpose. Paul was not the direct beneficiary of that redemptive purpose. What Paul was saying in Philippians 2, it was the guards that were going to hear the gospel. It was the Christians that were observing that were being encouraged by Paul's suffering. There was a redemptive purpose. There was eternal good, but it was not for Paul's comfort. For you and I to be able to reconcile some of the uncertain things that are happening, we will lose our anchor point when we don't have a very good answer to why is God allowing this to happen? Or take it further, why is God doing this? It's hard. I don't like it. That, that might be true. But you and I need to know that the reason why God is allowing some of these hard things is because there's good that comes out of the heart. And God's definition of good is going to be different than yours and mine. So when Joseph is saying it was good that I was here, Joseph fully understood that the benefits to his hardship were not his own benefits, but the benefits of his people. He saw the purpose. He saw what God was doing. 
Jesus, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, uh, I have come that you might have life. And that life is not bios, it's not the heart beating, it's not the lungs breathing, it's the, the Greek word zoe. And a simple definition of zoe life is it's a God-authored quality of life that's given to us through Jesus, and its quality is not dependent on circumstances. Zoe life, when Jesus says the life that I have come to give you, it's a God-authored quality of life. It was God's idea that's given to us through Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, and our acceptance of the forgiveness that comes from Jesus' death on the cross. We have this God-authored quality of life that's given us by Jesus. That God-authored quality of life is it's fantastic, and it's never predicated on our current physical environment. It is not circumstantial. That is why when you see throughout scripture, people going through hard times are able to have some joy in their heart, some contentment or some peace in their heart. Friends, you and I have to be able to draw the distinction that good things come out of hard situations. That when you and I are in a hard situation, it's uncertain, it's painful, people are sinning against you, that there is a redemptive outcome. And that redemption might be for someone else. Someone else might benefit from it, not you. And you and I, as Jesus' people, we have to trust the good hand of God involved in every single situation. There, there's... I want to look back on Joseph's life because I think when we look back on Joseph's life, the things that you and I would see as setbacks were not setbacks, but it was strategic positioning. And you're going to go, oh, yeah, that, oh, wow, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I get that. Why? Because I want you to remember that when you are going through your own hardships, when I am going through my own hardships, that we remember this. Because it might look one way in the physical, but in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm, it's a totally different situation. So let's just walk through this just for a moment. So we know that Joseph's whole slide into uncertainty started in Genesis chapter 37 with the dreams that he shared with his brothers, and his brothers had to... Uh, send him into slavery. They sold him off. That really sucks. That it's kind of unjust for Joseph that their sin of jealousy, the brothers, Joseph is taking it in the punch in the gut because of that. How could a loving God allow that to happen? But when we look in Genesis 45, we know that he is the governor of Egypt and he's governing over everything. There's only one person above him in the, in the government and that's Pharaoh himself. So let me ask you this. How does God get Joseph out of his Hebrew culture and context into an Egyptian one? That's how his brothers, follow me. His brother's sin worked out for God's redemptive good. The betrayal of his family members, God used that for a redemptive good. So how does God get a Hebrew boy positioned in a way where he could be the governor over Egypt? Sell him into slavery. He transitioned. It wasn't chance and luck that his life was spared. It wasn't chance and luck that the caravan uh, was going by and he landed in Egypt. That was all God's providential care. Relocating him to Egypt at a young enough of an age where he's going to learn the language and he's going to learn the culture and the customs. 
let's keep going. Joseph needed to learn about governing. He needed to learn politics. He needed to learn all of this stuff. So it's logical why God, in his providential care, would place him in the Potiphar's house. He's already got the language. He's already got uh, the customs. He, he is functionally an Egyptian, though he was born a Hebrew. And so he's learning politics. He's learning how this works. He's learning who's who in government. That makes sense. We, can, we get that. But then why would Joseph, by being pure, when, when Potiphar's wife went to hit on him and he said no, he got thrown into prison. That seems like, again, an unjust God allowing terrible things to happen and, and we, we can't reconcile the two. And I'm going to argue it's simple. So Joseph learns the language, he learns the culture and the customs, and he's now understanding government. He now needs to learn management. The Bible tells us that Joseph was running the, the prison Genesis chapter 39, verse 22. Everything that looked like a setback or a hardship or punishment wasn't. It was a loving God working on a redemptive plan to to unite all things, things in heaven and things on earth in Jesus. So Joseph is in prison working hard for free, probably. He didn't get upset at God. This is the thanks I get. I've wasted so much time. My life is worthless. My life is meaningless. I'm rotting in this station of prison and I'm working. Forget that. I'm just gonna sit and sulk in my... No, he didn't do any of that. I love that when his, the two inmates had a dream, Joseph was letting his spirit his giftings, his spiritual giftings, and his relationship with the Lord come out. He wasn't hiding it, and he interpreted the dreams. And the one inmate says, I'm going to remember you when I get out. Joseph's going, sweet, I'm out. Wasn't supposed to be here in the first place. I'm going to be free. And he was forgotten again. Are you kidding me? Why would God do this? Again, when we look back, because things in Egypt, the, the famine had to get ready to come. The, 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 the seven years of plenty had to get ready to come. Things had to get orchestrated. There's a, there's a timing to God's providential care. And he had to wait just a few more years. And then Pharaoh has this dream. And he, he wants all of his, uh, his uh, spiritual guides and aides to say, tell me the dream. And they're like, no problem, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. No, 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 no. If you are who you say you are, you should, get, you should know the dream without me telling you. Well, it stumped everybody. It stumped everybody but the one inmate who goes, I know a guy. So now there is, in in Pharaoh, there is this desperation. There is this tension of like, I'm I'm so stirred up. I don't know what to do. It was God who was stirring him up, of course. There is somebody who can do this. Bring him to me. Joseph comes, said, here's your dream. And here's what it means. And Pharaoh says, you're my guy. Puts a ring on his finger It says, you're running everything. You realize that for us, when we look at that situation, we're like, I see see God's providential care in that. My point for taking so much time on this is because I want you, when you are going through questions and hardships, to go, God is as involved in the minutia of my life as he was with Joseph's. You are not forgotten. You're, 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 you're not disposable. You're not wasting your time at all. 
This is to build us faith. And what is most interesting also for me in this is the relationship with his brothers seems to be coming together. Like, you realize because Joseph saw God's hand that there was opportunity for forgiveness of people who treated him unjustly. That's sometimes hard for you and I, but in, when we look through situations through the lens of providence, we're like, okay, some of you in this room, I'm just playing the odds, I don't know details, have been really mistreated by people. And you're having a hard time forgiving them because of the unjustness that you have experienced. And you, you call it a righteous anger because you feel morally in the, in the, in the right and you deserve the right to withhold any forgiveness for those people. And just so we're clear, I'm not saying that you need to resume a dysfunctional relationship with the people that have done terrible things to you. I'm not saying that. But I love the reconciliation, the forgiveness that happened in Joseph's heart for people that have harmed him. Verse 45, verses 9 through to 15. Joseph says, hurry up and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and don't tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children, the betrayers, and your children's children and your flocks, your herds and all that you have. And there I will provide for you for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. Verse 12. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see. That is, that is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all of my honor in Egypt, and that all that you have seen, hurry and bring my father back down here. Verse 14. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. What an unbelievable story of reconciliation, of healing, of resolution. Because Joseph embraced the doctrine of providence, It provided purpose in the hardship and it paved the way for repair. So I just want to ask you, as I'm talking, how is this sitting with you? Because we have given ourselves sometimes a pass to get angry with God because of the hardship, to get angry with people and to hold forgiveness. I want you to know that, like for, just for your help, that the brothers' sin, they're still accountable for their sin. God's not letting them off the hook. It's not like they have a pass. But in God's economy of scale, even sinful things can turn into redemptive things. And I believe that there's some of us in this room who need to actually... Come to Jesus. That's how we started in Hebrews chapter 4. Who can sympathize with everything that you're feeling. Why? Because he's been through it himself. I wonder how many of us have told a lie that God has no idea what I'm going through. And I'm here to tell you, Scripture tells us he knows exactly what it is. And for some of us, we need to actually come to Jesus and say, I can't do this on my own, Jesus. I need grace I need mercy in this time of need. And there's a promise that Jesus will give that to you. For some of us, it's to actually be forgiving people. We're about to move into communion. I'm actually going to ask the band to make their way up. We're not even supposed to take communion if there's unforgiveness in our hearts. Like, we're stopped. Some of us are going, why am I stuck spiritually? I'm in this plateau. I'll tell you why. There's hard hearts. 
and there's bitterness. And what I love about this text, what I love about Genesis chapter 44 and 45, but in this entire narrative, is that a holy God can work all things to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But there's a caveat in that Romans 8.28 text. It's for those who are in Jesus. That promise is only for Jesus' people. Maybe there's some of you here who you're a skeptic and you're visiting and you're not sure what to do. I want to invite you to have a relationship with Jesus. And by that, you recognize that there is sin in your life and you are not able to break out of and find the freedom that you're looking for. I want you to know that Jesus came to this earth and lived a sinless life and died on the cross in your place for your sins. And you're going to experience redemption. You're going to experience healing spiritually, also emotionally, even physically. Because this is what Jesus does. Lord, I just pray that wherever we're at in our spiritual journey, if there's some of us who were in this plateau and we've been angry and bitter with God and with others, and we've been pointing the finger everywhere else. Lord, I just pray about your Holy Spirit that you would show us the areas in our lives where that bitterness is taken root, where that hard heart is taken root, that we might just take this moment and confess to you, King Jesus. That it's just a really poor response to hurt and to brokenness. The appropriate response is to bring it to you so we can find help in time of need. For those of us that are so far from you, we don't know you as Lord and Savior. I just pray that that there would be something in our hearts right now to just cause us to move into into the direction of you, Jesus. That we recognize you as Lord, God, Savior, and King. That we would confess our sin to you even right now that we'd fully receive righteousness. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the communion servers to make their way up. We're just going to move into a time of communion. And if you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I want to invite you to come up and take communion. It's a phenomenal reminder of what Jesus, our great high priest, has done puts the cross at the focal point of our lives, not our circumstances, not our situation. But before we do, I just want us to just take a moment and to do a spiritual check of where we're at. If there's sin in your life, ask God to forgive it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So why don't we stand to our feet? And when you're ready, come and take communion.